Church in Highland. Um, we welcome you. If you're a visitor or a first time uh, visitor, we just want you to feel welcome and we hope that you've been given a visitor's card by now and we trust that you will um, be blessed as you worship with us this morning. Um, we've got some exciting uh, visitors here this morning that we'll introduce a little later. Uh, but we just want you to be happy that you came into God's house this morning. If you would, would you stand with me as we recite the call to worship? God has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of His own purpose and grace. This grace had, was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Let us worship God with joy and grace. Pray with me. O oh God, we come to you to worship you with joy and gladness. We are so thankful to be in your house this day, this glorious, beautiful fall day. We thank you for the wonderful weather that you have sent our way. We pray a blessing on the farmers in the Highland area as they uh, harvest their crops. We just ask for safety and blessings for each of them. We thank you, Lord, for our church and its people. We thank you for visitors and for folks that would come to be a part of this fellowship this day. We thank you for the opportunities that we find in worship to praise you and to glorify your holy name. Now, Lord, be with us as we sing and we worship and we pray and we hear the word of God, for it's in Christ's name we pray this morning. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing a couple of praise hymns. Linda? Good morning, everybody. It has been a really busy weekend around this church. We just had a rally yesterday and a bunch of very, very wonderful people from all around the southern part of the state and over on the eastern side came here, had a chance to fellowship with them, had some great food, some great speakers. Patty was here, Patty Milio. We're always blessed when she comes to share with us. And now we have another chance to uh, worship God and to sing his praises this morning. Um, I noticed there's only one praise song. Did we change something? Because Matt sent two. No, there's two. There's two? Okay, well, guess what? There's this one and a surprise. So <laughs> he, he sent me two. I know what the second one is as soon as it comes up on the screen anyway. So uh, let's all sing Praise the Lord.
introduce because you've met him before. Um, Mark Kirkhoff from International Ministries is one of the regular guest preachers when I'm away, and it's interesting. I don't think he and I have ever actually been in the church at the same time. So Mark um, emailed this week, and he said, I'm going to be passing through. Can I come here you preach for a change? So uh, we welcome Mark Kirkhoff from I am. Thank you, I appreciate it. But actually, what, what I wanted to do, I have spoken here several times before, and I appreciate it. It's one of my favorite places to come and worship and, and to speak. I decided it was about time to come and uh, hear for myself the standard to which I need to rise when I do come and speak. So uh, it is a pleasure. Rob and I have seen each other at other places and uh, never been to worship together, actually. So uh, it's a blessing to be here today with you all, as always, but a special blessing for me to come and hear the Word of God as presented uh, by Rob this morning. So. I uh, do, as always, bring greetings from our uh, Executive Director, CEO, Sharon Cole, and our 100, it's approaching now 130 global servants around the world. Uh, we have eight new global servant units, uh, couples and individuals who are now newly endorsed and who we are sending out. We appreciate your support of them and our mission and ministry around the world. You are so, so very generous. And I don't, are you in world mission offering mode yet? Or just starting. Out? Just starting, okay. Many churches are. Um, I, I should also bring greetings. I've been at the Central Region meeting in uh, Muskogee, Oklahoma this weekend, uh, down at Macomb College. And on my way home from there, uh, they, too, many of the churches in the Central Region are in World Mission Offering mode as well. It is through your offerings to World Mission Offering that you support all of our mission. And we appreciate all that you do. And again, you are so generous. We thank you. And blessings upon your offering. I do leave some of the brochures back on the welcome stand and just continue to offer my support as your donor advisor questions or need additional information, please feel free to reach out to me directly or through Pastor Rob, through your region office, uh, to continue to support so generously uh, your missionaries, your global service around the world. I think uh, Rob and I were talking, there are six of them from Illinois and uh, a few of them even here in southern Illinois that uh, go forth, that who you send out around the world to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And I tell folks, we can't do what we do except you do what you do. You are such a blessing to us. So I simply bring our greetings and blessings to you. And thank you. God bless you. And Mark and I were talking before church in a week from Monday. Um, I'll be going back to Hungary with a group of pastors from the Great Rivers region. Um, every time we make a trip overseas, we plant more seeds and build more relationships. And we're reminded that we are a global church. Even though we're just a little congregation here in Highland, we do reach around the world. Um, we go now to our time of prayer. The prayer request, the prayer list is printed in your bulletin. Let's pray together. God of grace and love, you sent your Son to seek out and to comfort. Hear our prayers on behalf of those who are struggling in our day. Receive our prayers and our thanksgivings with your unending compassion. We pray for the whole church, all of God's people, here and everywhere around the world, especially in our American Baptist family. We pray for our General Secretary, Jeff Woods. We pray for our regional leadership. We remember Patty Billion. And all of our clergy and our global servants, we pray for your church and its leaders, that they would lead your church in compassion and grace. We pray for peace, for goodwill between peoples, in a world where it is increasingly easy to see those with a different opinion as an enemy instead of a brother or sister. Lord, have mercy on us. We pray for the poor, the sick, and the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. These least of these who are near and dear to your heart, Lord, may they also be near to our hearts. May, be, 
May we be aware of their needs and show us, Lord, how we can ease their discomfort. Lord, we offer not just the prayers of our hearts, but our hands and our feet and our lives. Use us to ease their discomfort. We pray for those who seek a deeper understanding of you, Lord. We pray that they may find and be found by you. Today, as we move forward into our harvest and Thanksgiving season, we give you our gratitude. And we are especially thankful for seasonable weather and for a good harvest. We do pray for the continued safety of our farmers and those who work the fields this time of year. We thank you for the blessings you have given to this church, for leading us and guiding us, and we pray that you continue to show us a path forward. Show us, Lord, how we can serve this community. Redeeming, sustainer, visit your people, pour out your strength and courage upon us, that we may hurry to make you welcome, not only in our concern for others, but by serving one another generously and faithfully in your name. All these things we pray as Christ our Savior has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we go now to our time of offering, an offering sentence this morning comes from Ephesians, the fifth chapter of Ephesians. Walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, let us do likewise. If the ushers would come forward to gather today's gifts and offerings.
Giving God, we give you our thanks and our praise for all of your gifts to us. We know that you are the source of every good thing. Light and love come from you. You have created us. You have continued to breathe life into us through the power of your Holy Spirit. You have given us so much, and it's because we recognize the gifts you have given to us that we now give to the work of your kingdom. We dedicate these offerings to the work of your kingdom here on earth. May this collection be used wisely and diligently, that your love may be known widely. As we dedicate this offering, we offer ourselves too, for the gifts of money are just tokens of ourselves. Take us and use us, that our hands may reach out in service, and that our feet may walk the difficult path of reconciliation, and that our words may be words of peace. All of this we pray in the name of our giving Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Before we share in the proclaiming of God's word, I just want to say thank you to a couple of people. Gloria, it's so good to see you at the organ and to, yep, there you are. She's my cousin, so I got to say hi to her. Uh, and, you know, I don't know how many of you noticed some of the landscaping things that have been done around the church this summer. Manfred Treesner, and I know he's not in here right now, but I just want to say thank you to Manfred. He got rid of those two thorn bushes that have just been driving me crazy for the last 22 years. So I've still got the little uh, pricks in my, in my fingers uh, from those thorn bushes. So thank you, Manfred. And to all of you who do so much for our church, the building, for missions, and for everything that we do here at First Baptist, I just want to say thank you. Now this morning, uh, you see that we're in Lamentations, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, and I'd like to share that with you now before we get into the New Testament. How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become, she that was great among the nations. She that was a princess among the provinces has become a vassal. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers she has no one to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hard servitude. She lives now among the nations and finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to the festivals. All her gates are desolate, her priests groan, her young girls grieve, and her lot is bitter. Her foes have become the masters, her enemies prosper, because the Lord has made her suffer for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From daughter Zion has departed all her majesty. Her princes have become like stags that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. And then in the New Testament, 2 Timothy 1, 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God whom I worship with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your 
your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Do not be ashamed, then, of the testimony about our Lord, of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I have put my trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. May God add a wonderful blessing to the reading of this, his holy word. Amen. Well, you know, knowing the three of 
three of you, my guess would be that it's Malachi. Nope. And it wasn't me either. <laughs> hmm. So it was Eddie? What on earth, Eddie, did you do to get in trouble this week? Well, there's this one kid at school that picks on me. He sneaked and tied my shoelaces together so I'd trip and fall on my face. He started hiding my pencils or my papers so I couldn't do my homework. He drives me nuts. So I decided to get him back. Yep. Eddie told us that that kid brings his lunch to school every day. Yep. And it's always the same thing. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich with a banana. So I brought a thick slice of onion with me from home and slipped it in the sandwich when he wasn't looking. You gross, right? Yep. I was there when Eddie did it. The kid took a huge bite of that sandwich, and you should have seen his face. We thought it was pretty funny at first. Right, funny. Until he broke out over in hives. Now, how was I supposed to know he was allergic to onions? Next thing you know, the school nurse was there, and then the principal. I got called to the office, and now I'm suspended for recess for three weeks. Oh my goodness, but you know what? You're lucky that the punishment wasn't working, Eddie. I hope you learned a lesson from this. Yeah, you know, I feel kind of bad. There's a verse from the Bible that I wish I'd taught for you before all this happened. It's from Psalm 37. It says, don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. Trust in the Lord and do good. Right. There are lots of passages in the Bible that warn us about the dangers of trying to get revenge on someone who's hurt us. Just like 1 Peter 3, 9. Do not return evil for evil or insult for insult, but give a blessing instead. What? You mean I'm supposed to give this? So you're supposed to give a blessing to someone who pulls pranks on me all the time? What can that do? Well, for one thing, it would show that kid how a Christian person is supposed to behave. Yeah, maybe this kid, you know, hasn't been taught very much about right and wrong. Maybe God needs for you to teach him. Me? A teacher? But I'm a kid. Kids can't be teachers. Teachers are old. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! Not necessarily, Eddie. Anyone can be a teacher at any age, even you. But if but if he's mean to me and I'm nice to him, he'll think I'm a wimp. It doesn't matter what he thinks. It matters what God thinks. And God thinks people who do the right thing are strong. Right. Read Romans 15, 1 and 2. He who, we who are strong in faith should help those who are weak to help them be stronger in faith. So, according to God, people who pick on us are weak and people who believe themselves are strong? Hmm, I kind of like this Chris to me stuff. <laughs> Just keep coming to church with me, and you will. How about a quick prayer, Miss Brenda, please? All right. Heavenly Father, it is hard sometimes when people are mean to us. I mean, our first reaction is we want to get back at them. But just like it says in the Bible, we should not return evil for evil. But ask for your blessing on those people, and that they'll change. And in the end, It'll help us too. We pray that you will bless us this week, and if we come up against someone who is mean to us, that we all know exactly what to do. In your name, amen. 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 Thank you, Ms. Brenda. All right, you two, it's a challenge. Let's see if we can go out and do nothing but good all week. All it's a real good. challenge for me. All week, nothing time. but good. The right. Ted is in that bar, all the way up there. Yeah. Okay, all yes. week. You betcha. Nothing but track. Good. Okay. Okay, I'll see you back. Bye. Bye. See you next week. All week. All week. All week. You can remain seated. We'll sing together this hymn as we prepare our hearts for the sermon, hymn number 405. My faith has found a resting place.
<laughs> Pastoral ministry started the same way for me. I started preaching in my mid-20s before going to seminary, but I always enjoyed talking. Any one of my grade school teachers could attest to that. So after I started preaching, I reached out to a couple of veteran pastors for some general advice, and they both sent me letters. The first pastor wrote me a lengthy list of things to do and not to do. He offered advice on what to wear during worship, about what books I should be reading, about when to be present in the church office and how I should go visit shut-ins and how often and how long my sermons should be. It was four pages of typed thoughts on how to be a pastor, very detailed. The second pastor's letter arrived a week later his letter, which I still keep tucked in my Bible in my office, said, Dear Rob, the best advice I can give you is not to burden yourself with the advice of others. Just be yourself. <laughs> it's interesting, right? These two different approaches. And I'm reminded of these two pastoral letters today because that's exactly what our New Testament reading is from 2 Timothy. Timothy was a young pastor who felt very lightly in over his head in this new role that he was in. And these letters of First and Second Timothy are letters of encouragement, letters from a mentor, from a trusted teacher and colleague. With great affection, the author writes to Timothy, my beloved child, and tells him that he is remembered in daily prayer. And in today's reading, the letter reminds Timothy that even though he's in a new position, position of new responsibilities, and it all seems quite overwhelming, God has been preparing him, preparing him for this role for a very long time, for a couple generations, in fact. Young Timothy is reminded that his faith is a product of his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois, and I think this is a lesson for us, especially if we've been blessed to be raised up in the church. We often learn our faith from our family from other teachers or pastors or mentors. We are mentored and nurtured in our faith in a variety of ways. And the community of faith, Christians, the church, ideally is what supports and nurtures us in our faith the most. And that's why participation in church is so vitally important. When people ask me, why is it so important to go to church? Can't I be a Christian all on my own? This is exactly what I tell them. We are encouraged and nurtured by others when we participate in the community of faith. But we also, perhaps without even realizing it, we also provide nurturing and encouragement to others. Our faith is influenced by others, and our own faithfulness influences the faith of others. This is why we call the church the community of faith. This letter to Timothy also calls us to rekindle the, the gift of God that we receive in our own baptism, a spirit of power, a spirit of love, a spirit of self-discipline. Do you remember the promises we make in baptism? We just had a baptism here a few weeks ago. No matter if you were baptized in the Baptist tradition or if you were baptized and then confirmed in another tradition, the baptismal vows are pretty much universal across all of Christianity. Do you believe in and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And then the second one, will you strive to follow Jesus in thought, word, and deed through all the days of your life? And one of the really neat things about baptism is that it's always done in a communal setting. Have you noticed that? Baptisms are not private events because the community, the family, the church also makes a vow. When a person is baptized, parents, godparents, church, friends, were all asked, will you nurture and support this person in their faith, or some variation of that? And this is true across all denominations of Christianity, because we all recognize that our faith is a communal thing, where we support, encourage, and inspire one another. So through this special bond of baptism, the entire Christian community has a responsibility to hand on to others what has already been handed to us. We are, for better or for worse, one big family. And as a family, our greatest heirloom we pass from one generation to another is our faith. And that's the gist of this letter to Timothy today. Our greatest resource in the church 
It's not our building. It's not all of the things we do. Our greatest resource in the church is one another, right? If you look around this morning, those people seated around you, that's the most valuable resource in your faith. Our greatest support is each other. Our greatest strength is each other. And that's because God calls us to work and live for each other. Young Timothy is reminded that God has already equipped the church to do what God needs the church to do. And the Christian community is reminded that the Holy Spirit is with us to guide us through both good times and bad. These are really encouraging words Timothy received all except for that one part. Among the encouragement and inspiration, this letter invites Timothy to join with me in suffering for the gospel. And when I read that, I say, what's that now? Join with you in suffering? Nah, not really interested in that part. Some of us come to church precisely because we need to get away from some suffering, or at least hand it over to Jesus and get it off our own hearts. For better or for worse, this is also part of our heirloom of faith, our history and our legacy as a community. And we see this in our reading today from the Book of Lamentations, our Old Testament reading. We see this in our other reading where we see poems expressing profound sadness and raw pain and deep sorrow. Our faith ancestors, the Israelite people, endured tremendous hardships and personal suffering as their holy city of Jerusalem was destroyed in 587 BC. Our faith ancestors, the holy city and temple for them was signs of God's strength and power. And when all of that is destroyed and gone, the Israelite people, they wept. They wept and, you know, you have to be in a really, truly dark place to feel as though God has completely turned his back on. And that's where the Israelites are in our reading from Lamentations this morning. The Israelites had watched their beloved city invaded and ravaged, desecrated and devastated, and they were tormented and mocked while they were held in captivity by the Babylonians. To say the least, times were downright depressing for the Israelite people, discouraging to say the, the least, so discouraging they felt abandoned and betrayed by God. This is what Timothy's letter is referring to when he invites us to join in the suffering for the gospel. That's true, I think I'm inclined to say, man, I don't want to do all that. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to feel discouraged and defeated. From the book of Lamentations, the Lord has broken my teeth on gravel and ground me into dust. My life was bereft of peace and I forgot what happiness was. Those are words from a dark place. The voice of lamentation is fierce and strong. But even amidst all that pain and suffering, there's still a glimmer of hope. In the third chapter of Lamentations, the author writes, But this I do call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The kindness of the Lord has not ended. His mercy is not spent. In other words, though the tunnel may be long and dark, I can see the light at the other end. And I think this is precisely the lesson that Timothy gets in his pastoral letter today. Times may get tough, and sometimes things may even seem downright desolate, but hang in there, right? Hang in there because the faith that sustained the Israelite people through the darkest of their lamentations has been passed down from one generation to the next, and now it's ours. And this faith, this faith of resilience and hope, is a faith that we continue to pass down to the next generation. Amen. Remember that faith is not a feeling. <clears throat> faith isn't something you feel. Faith is a way of living. It's a way of living that keeps us from giving up when things seem hopeless. And this is the faith that was passed to Timothy from his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. And Timothy passes this faith down to his followers, to a community that lives and worships together in the same way God's people have been doing for thousands of years. And that's the key to this lesson today. Timothy is reminded that no matter what life throws in our way, we can persevere as a community, supporting one another, a community equipped and inspired by those who came before us, and a community that offers encouragement and hope to all of those who rise up after us. 
doesn't mean that there won't be time for lamentation still. Unfortunately, part of being a human being means sometimes experiencing darkness and sadness. To quote the prophetic words of the Shirelles, Mama said there'd be days like these, there'd be days like these, my mama said. <laughs> Are you familiar with that prophecy? Yeah. Life is not all sunshine and roses, and we know this. I think we all know this. The first century church, they knew that. Timothy knew that, and our lessons today remind us that there will be times of suffering, but we know that life can also be quite joyful at times and wonderful. And as human beings, we get the delight of experiencing the full gamut of all of the emotions life has to offer. And that's what today's lesson reminds us, that whatever comes, the good and the bad, we experience it together. Together as a community, a community of faith that was established long before our time, a community that will continue to worship together long after us. One of the greatest gifts God has given us is each other. You may never know how something as simple as a smile and a gesture of friendship can brighten the outlook of your neighbor who may be going through an especially dark time. We may never know how the perseverance and the resilience of those who came before us give us courage in our day, and we may never realize how the camaraderie and the companionship and fellowship of the Christian community today will provide encouragement and strength to others in days to come. This is the gift of the church, the community of believers, the heirloom of faith. Paul calls this a good treasure. And we may never fully appreciate how our faith gets handed down from generation to generation. But of this, I am absolutely certain. This heirloom of faith that has been passed down and entrusted now to us is indeed a good treasure. It gives us hope when things seem hopeless. It gives us courage and strength as a community. Two are better than one because if one falls, the other is there to lift them up, right? So I give thanks to all of you, to all of us who have been led and encouraged in our faith, and now it's our time to continue that legacy of our people, to rekindle the spirit within us for the sake of those yet to come, to remember our call to live not as individuals, but as a community of faith, nurturing and supporting one another so that those who come after us have us to use as a guide and example. May God bless those who have come before us and guided us in our faith. May God bless us as we ourselves live lives of faith. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for all of those whose faith and witness have enlightened us and brought us closer to you. Strengthen us by your spirit that we may encourage the faith of others. We ask this in the name of Christ, our Redeemer and our guide. Amen. If you would stand as you're comfortably able, we'll sing together a hymn of response. I know who I have believed. It's number 409 in the hymn. <laughs>
tells us that as Christ sat at table with two of his followers, he was made known to them in the breaking of bread. At this table, we invite all who believe in him and who are in fellowship with one another to partake of this, the Lord's Supper. Let us give thanks to God, shall we? It is right to give you thanks and praise, Lord. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven who forever sing the glory of your name. Gracious God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we lift our hearts and offer thanks to you for the wonders of the world around us, for humankind and the richness of love, for each new day of forgiveness and grace. With thanksgiving, we remember the one who was with you from the beginning, through whom all things were made, whose life is the light of the world, and who became flesh and lived among us as Jesus, our Messiah. For his life and ministry, for his teaching and example, and for his love, we give you thanks, God. For his victory on the cross, we give you thanks, God. For the hope that comes through his resurrection, and for the promise that in him all things will be made new, we give you thanks, God. All of these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and shared it with his friends, saying, This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, also sharing it with his friends, explaining that this cup is a symbol of the new covenant. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. This is the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Will you pray with me once more? Grant, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit may be with us in this moment, and that through this bread and this cup, set apart for remembrance and thanksgiving, that Christ may come to dwell among us, and through him we may come to know you more closely. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. Amen.
down at the bottom of the cup. That's where the bread is. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Stand with me. We'll pray together in um, unison our communion prayer of dedication. Let's pray. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. Most merciful God, Take our hands, which have held that which is consecrated, and work through them. Take our lips, which have tasted the signs of the body and blood of our Lord, and speak through them. Take our eyes, which have received the bread and wine, and make them fit temples of your spirit. Take our minds and mold them, that our thoughts may be your thoughts. Take our hearts and fill them with your love, that we may truly serve you in the world. Amen. In our congregation, it's customary on Communion Sundays to join hands and sing together the first verse of Blessed Be the Tithe of Pines. Remember one another in your prayers and continue to offer yourselves to Christ. And may God give you grace, mercy, and peace. May Jesus Christ lead you into life and faith, and may the Holy Spirit live within you and rekindle good gifts within you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. 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 